Welcome everyone. It's three past and so we'll get going here, but I want to say thanks for joining and um, I think we got some exciting stuff to cover today and we'll look for feedback as we always do on where we're going um, with the open EE meter work here. So uh, I'll just cut right to the chase and uh, talk about our agenda. So uh, first and foremost, we'll always be talking about 2.1 until we're fully over the finish line with 2.1 and we have just a quick update to share today. And then the bulk of today's meeting will be on the hourly methods. Uh, so I know that the last time around, we did a deep dive into the Caltrack 2.0 hourly methods. I'm going to go over those slides again today, but I'm going to do so much quicker uh, just to give kind of a refresh of those methods, because ultimately the barometer by which we're going to be judging Caltrack 3.0 on will be how it performs relative to 2.0. And we'll talk about how we can get to those comparisons today as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about some decision points uh, that we'll need to make as we embark upon the hourly model research, uh, kind of what we want to tackle this time around, what we want to lead by the wayside uh, so that we can move quickly, but also, you know, come up with a model ultimately that serves the major goals that we've set forward, uh, chief among them developing accurate counterfactuals uh, for hourly meters and doing so for not only non-solar customers, but for solar customers as well. Uh, and then we'll dive into some current progress and share some of uh, our thinking. And, and even, I'll just spoil it now, we have a one preliminary result that we would share with, with everybody because we've just started to dip our toes in the water on the actual R&D. Um, <clears throat> so wrapping up Open EE Meter 2.1, uh, what to expect. By the way, we probably should have a slide on this, but let me just mention to the group and feel free to call me out uh, if, if you hear me saying this, but it's it's very ingrained, so I'm sure you will hear me say this. Uh, we would like to change the nomenclature around uh, these models away from Caltrack and more to Open EE Meter. Uh, and the reason we would like to do that is we've received feedback um, from clients outside of California and just entities outside of California, not just our, our clients, but uh, from folks who say, well, you know, it, it kind of rubs us the wrong way that this whole model is you know, deemed a California model, Caltrack. Do I even know whether it will work on my data or, you know, is it, is it, if you, if it's open source and it's truly universal, then why are you um, restricting it in naming convention to California? Um, so we're going to try to shift our own use of language here toward the open EE meter. Uh, and that actually coincides with some of our open source strategy as well to consolidate both the methods and the code under the Linux Foundation. Right now, believe it or not, uh, the code itself in the OpenEE meter is part of the Linux Foundation energy, and the methods are not. So one of the things we're doing in this working group uh, via 2.1 is to consolidate and bring under one single umbrella both the methods and the code. Uh, so we're going to shift to using the name OpenEE Meter to describe both the methods and the code. Uh, and something that Travis likes to point out is the code is, is sophisticated enough at this point that uh, it really should be the actual source of truth uh, in what's going on in the methods uh, and can be used in coincidence with a detailed description of what's happening, but that if there are ever any uh, questions about what's actually happening, then it shouldn't be the methods necessarily that dictates the answer to that. It's the code. Uh, so we can talk more about that as time goes on. But what's happening with 2.1 right now? We put all this work into the daily model. We got a lot of great feedback from the group um, and we iterated to a final solution. And we're at the point now where we're hopeful that by the next meeting, we will actually merge the pull request uh, for 2.1, make it fully available to everybody. Um, and that we will also be releasing comprehensive R&D results uh, to back up you know, the decisions that were made in the final form formulation of the model, because there's a lot of things that we tested. There's a lot of information available to show the performance of this model uh, relative to 2.0 and just as it stands alone. So 
we're going to try to get all of this across the finish line uh, by the next meeting. Um, fingers crossed, not promising, but we're very hopeful. And then uh, just a couple specific updates. There will be a quick start guide. Uh, I believe this is via a notebook that Jason on uh, at Recurve has led uh, the development of. So this quick start will help you just get up and running, help explain what's going on, allow you to run some some simple models uh, that you can use, to, and you can also use this to test on on daily data. Uh, and then we're continuing to refactor the code. So Travis led the development of the code base itself. Now we're trying to refactor it so that it fits nicely within OpenE Meter and can be run in a scalable and very transparent way. So uh, we're in the middle of all of that. And hopefully by the time the next meeting rolls around, we will be at done or nearing completion with, with 2.1, which is very exciting. So, okay, as I mentioned, um, I'll still call it Caltrack in 2.0. Going forward, we'll call it OpenE Meter. Uh, to dive back into the hourly method, like I said, I went over this uh, in the last meeting. So in this meeting, we'll just touch on this briefly to remind ourselves kind of high level what's going on in the Caltrack uh, 2.0 model. Uh, broad strokes here. So this is a time of week and temperature model. That just means that the variables in the model are the hour of week. There are 168 hours in a week and the temperature. So you get a unique prediction for Tuesday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 3 a.m., or Saturday at 4 p.m., or whatever it might be. And we can take a look at a meter's average annual weekly load shape, and it might look something like this. But this, of course, masks the fact that when you break out the load shape by month, then you get dramatically different load load shape in July than you do in September, than you do in December, and so forth. So it's not enough just to have a model that does time of week and temperature prediction. Uh, you got to know kind of where in the year you are. So for that reason, the 2.0 model creates an independent model for every single month of the year. And the data that feeds into that model is, uh, compri is comprised of the month uh, in question. So in this case, in this little bar chart on the bottom, June, but you also take half weighting from the neighboring months, in this case, May and July. And then that model is used to produce a counterfactual for the following June for an individual meter. Uh, so we're trying to basically use as much data as is relevant and as is possible for any given time of the year, because by the time you break things into time of week and temperature, uh, there are not a lot of data points for any given predictive uh, data point that you're trying to predict. Uh, there's a, a temperature binning scheme that happens that is basically additive across uh, a bins from below 30 degrees all the way up to above 90 degrees. Uh, and basically, you need a threshold number of data points to fill out any given bin. Uh, so basically, the model is piecewise linear, and these are become coefficients, each of these temperature components become coefficients in the final model formulation. So if you have a data point at 48 degrees, you know, you're gonna be in the middle of that, of that bin, just as an example. So the initial, uh, then there's a, there's a whole occupancy step that happens whereby uh, you try to figure out the building state. So a lot of buildings will have time periods that they are uh, on and they're in operation and then other time periods where they are not. So think about like an office building that has uh, nine to five hours. And then if you're on Tuesday at you know 11 a.m., the building is most likely in an occupied state, whereas Sunday at 11 p.m., it's most likely not in an occupied state. So you wind up with uh, uh, coefficients in the model and parameters in the model that are aware of occupancy uh, uh, as determined by an initial regression model where we're just looking at residuals and we're trying to, de to determine uh, for any given hour of the year, do most of the data points have positive residual or negative residual? And the model to develop that is just a fixed balance point temperature that takes in all 8760 hours in a baseline period. Uh, and this is kind of what that looks like. So if you get a set of data that looks like this, then the hours that are 
uh, above and have positive residuals would be classified as occupied. The hours below uh, would be largely classified as unoccupied or, or create an unoccupied version of the model. Uh, and then you get two sort of independent uh, models that together comprise uh, the full model that you can use to predict any hour of the week for any time of year. Um, this is just the math behind the model. I'm not going to dive deep on each term. I'm going to skip to this slide where I just kind of laid it out in uh, handy dandy. Uh, what does each term represent? And basically, you can break it, the Caltrack 2.0 model into these four distinct terms that each represent something physical about the building's operation. First, uh, if you look at the very bottom, we have this sort of base load term, this always on consumption. Uh, and this, you know, just like everything, um, uh, or, or just like several of these terms, it is dependent on time of week. So you have this coefficient and then it's a time of week parameter. Uh, and it represents the always on consumption within the building. So it's included in both like an occupied state and an unoccupied state. Then you have another term that operates uh, on the unoccupied hours. And this is just a, a temperature term and it does not depend on time of week. So basically you're saying, okay, I have the building and it has a, 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 a profile even during unoccupied hours that depends on the time of week. Uh, and then I also have a temperature dependent consumption that happens even during unoccupied hours. So maybe the building has a, a 60 degrees set point and if it dips below that, it starts using, uh, using energy and that's what this temperature term is meant to represent. Then you have a temperature independent term uh, that is time of week dependent. And finally, a temperature dependent term that is time of week dependent, both that is not time of week dependent. Both of these uh, uh, are on the occupied hours. So again, some of the hours are going to be unoccupied and those unoccupied hours have their own terms. And then you layer on top of the unoccupied um, uh, prediction the extra terms that are associated with the increased consumption associated with occupied time periods, occupied hours. So, okay, that is a super brief rundown of Caltrack 2.0. I don't want to take a lot of time to answer questions on this. Uh, if, if you have questions on it, we can talk afterward. Uh, but wanted to relate this to where we're trying to actually go in a reformulated model. So, the existing issues with the model that I just described is number one, it's likely prone to overfitting. For every single data point that we're predicting, there's not a lot of data points that are feeding in to the model. The time of week uh, in particular really bifurcates everything into small bins. Uh, second, the model is just frankly incomplete for solar PV customers. So when you have a solar PV customer, their consumption is heavily dependent on sunshine. <laughs> and if you are not aware of sunshine in the model, uh, we call this solar irradiance, then the model is going to tend to over predict on cloudy days, uh, probably under predict solar consumption on, on, on uh, sunny days, or actually probably the reverse of that because solar generation leads to negative consumption. But the bottom line is you have Cloudy days, you have sunny days. If the model is not aware of that, then for solar PV customers, you are going to do a poor job of predicting their consumption patterns. Not only that, it creates high risk because if you have an entire month where by and large it was cloudy, and then that next month the following year it's sunny, the model is going to see that decreased consumption because of the increased PV generation as positive energy efficiency savings, which is not the behavior that you want out of a model. Um, <clears throat> so the upshot is, given the fact that the model is likely prone to overfitting, the last thing that we want to do is add more variables to the model, which we would sort of need to do to make the 2.0 model complete under its existing framework and aware of the solar irradiance uh, variable itself. And then finally, there, there are uh, what we're sort of calling inflexible inputs. So the model is very rigid, very structured. And if the machine itself determines, hey, there's a better way to go, well, too bad, you've already defined exactly the pathway for the model and it has to follow that pathway every time. 
Uh, so the goal of the 3.0 work ultimately is to uh, reduce the prospects of overfitting or underfitting um, and introduce solar irradiance variables so that we can have accurate counterfactuals for both solar customers and non-solar customers. And then to make the model, allow the model to take advantage of the patterns that it recognizes in the data. So to actually even extend beyond just, hey, we're gonna add solar irradiance, but maybe there are other weather variables that have a major impact on energy consumption. And if the model determines, hey, those other variables are super important for any given customer, then the model is flexible enough to take advantage of that data while at the same time not overfitting uh, a model. So with that, I think I'll hand the baton here to Armin, uh, who's really been leading our efforts thus far on the 3.0 work. Um, and I think we'll start with just an example of uh, what can happen when you have a model that is unaware of solar irradiance data, and then Armin can take us through the rest of the presentation. Armin, why don't I give you control of the screen uh, so that you don't have to keep asking but me? Before you do that, Greg yeah. has a question, I think. Sure, Greg, what, what's on your mind? Uh, you might be muted, Greg, if you're trying to speak. Oh, yep. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for letting me ask a question. Um, I know you probably don't want to maintain multiple code bases, but I'm curious if you give any thought to, you know, the inclusion of certain features or not including them, you know, based on residential versus commercial. They're obviously two very different um, from the standpoint of, you know, how much variability there is from the standpoint of like, you know, occupancy term or that kind of thing. Um, I can think of a lot of ways that you could potentially simplify a commercial model versus residential, perhaps, but has that been something you've considered or just, you just, you know, it's way easier to just keep it all under one umbrella? That is a good question. Talking about sort of like an open EE meter uh, commercial model and an open EE meter residential model kind of thing. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I think our goal is certainly to keep things under one roof. Having said that, potentially you can make the model aware of whether it is a residential or a commercial meter. Uh, and then the model would have different pathways that it could follow kind of thing, which at some point it becomes, well, why don't you just have two Python functions instead of having one Python function, right? Uh, that is more complex on its interior. Uh, that's a good question. Armin, Travis, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, on I have, I have yeah. one thing to add. That's why uh, we wanted to have a flexible input uh, one of the things that we wanted to add is temperature. We, we had temperature, we wanted to have solar data right now or any other like humidity, like wind speed, all of uh, other things that I mentioned in the couple of next slides. But at the same time, for example, for a commercial building or industrial building, if we have an input of uh, on and off uh, time series of some big device, that can be an input for the model and that took, take care of the whole a process for that specific individual, I mean, industrial um, location. So basically by having a flexible input, you can uh, kind of introduce and define if that's, that location is a residential or uh, industrial or commercial. So that's one of the things we can do about it. Yeah, most of the time, I think also we do have information on I would ask folks to speak up if this is not the case in, in your experience, but in our experience, most of the time we know that a customer is residential or non-residential. And most of the time we even know if they're non-residential, are they agriculture, industrial, are they typical commercial uh, and, or, or, or something else, government buildings. Those are, those are the kinds of flags we very oftentimes see. So I don't know that we would need to necessarily surmise whether a building is commercial or residential based on AMI data alone. Uh, we would probably have that. I think it's usually a safe bet to think that you're gonna have that kind of uh, information available to you. Um, so having said that, I think what we found in 2.1 was the 2.1 model worked very well for both residential and commercial. And in fact, we optimized it, all the hyperparameters, uh, taking into account uh, both commercial and residential data sets. Uh, so I would expect that we'll do something similar here. 
And if what we find is that the model behaves very, very differently, or the hyperparameters that we end up tuning um, are all just splitting a wide gap between residential and commercial, I think that's probably a good sign that two independent models would be better than one. Uh, so we'll probably start to get some of that information through the process of testing. And I, I that would be the, my suggestion would be for us to follow that kind of a route. And then if it becomes apparent that having two distinct models would be much better in terms of accuracy, then we can talk, we can cross that bridge when we get there. Make sense, Greg? Yeah, it's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Any other questions before I hand the baton to Armin? I'd like to add a little bit to that conversation. Um, I would be really hesitant uh, to just immediately jump to two separate models. Obviously, if there's good justification for that, I'm, I'm not going to stand against it. Um, however, one of the hopes with what we are are seeking with the, the new models are that they are flexible enough to be work for anything. Uh, because we're not going to have a, well, currently, we're not looking at structured models with here is a specific formula. They're much more uh, machine learning based models, which we can we can get into that a little bit below. Thanks, Travis. Yep, and Armin will talk quite a bit about some of that thinking uh, as we go today. So Armin, uh, let me stop yeah. sharing so that you can grab the screen. Uh, stop sharing, there we are. And feel free to take us take us on this journey. Sure, I am sharing my screen right now. Please let me know if you can see my screen. Looks good. Okay, great. Maybe uh, go into slideshow mode though so that we can have it uh, in full, full effect. Okay. So for the, uh, for the current model that we have, um, Caltrack 2.0 or Open EE Meter 2.0, we just have temperature and time of the week pretty much as the variables. Uh, we can infer a couple of other variables like uh, occupancy as well, but these are the main uh, variables that we have. Uh, one of the problems that Adam mentioned with the current model is that we're not aware of solar data, which is really important specifically for the solar customers. And I can say we have, we see the impact of this feature to the non-solar customer as well, but this is um, much more significant for the solar customers to consider solar irradiance data uh, for to, to model uh, the AMI uh, for, for uh, for the solar customers so there are two solutions for it we can go in in a way that we have the feature uh, the input features and we have one solid model and the um, sole purpose of that uh, model is to have uh, is to predict the ami values or having the uh, ami counterfactuals what we have in the 2.0 hourly model or we can go another route, which is actually we have two separate models, uh, which one of them is responsible to uh, uh, to model the electricity consumption of the of the uh, meter or the house or commercial building that we have, and the other model is basically trying to extract and predict the solar PV generation for the location. And then the aggregation of these two, or load minus solar, uh, will give us the AMI counterfactual. And at the same time, we have a load uh, time series and the solar generation uh, time series. So these are two general uh, approach that we can have uh, for the 3.0. So what do we mean by solar disaggregation? Again, real quick. So imagine we have a solar customers we have a pv panel on the rooftop but the only thing we can see and utility can see is the utility meter which is a combination of uh, electricity and consumption in the house and solar generation or basically load minus solar and we're going to have that uh, blue curve on the right side which is the observed data straight from and uh, random smart meter data that we plotted here and um, the negative shows that this is a 
solar PV customer. And the way we wanted to do that in the solar disaggregation approach, it would be uh, in a way that we have two separate signals, which one of them is the electricity consumption of the house, and the other one is the solar uh, generation. And to do that, um, we definitely need weather and solar data as a proxy to do uh, to extract these two. This is the concept of solar disaggregation. So either way, in either of these approach we wanted to uh, explore, uh, we need to define uh, our feature inputs. Uh, what do we want to use to model these things? And based on the literature review that we had the other time at the uh, previous session, uh, we saw that many papers, they use weather data as their uh, input time series data, which are temperature, mainly temperature, uh, we have humidity, wind speed, perceptible water, and so on. We can have uh, more uh, features uh, under this uh, category. And the other thing that we have, and this is really important to model um, the AMI prediction, AMI counterfactual within one uh, model, as you mentioned, uh, for example, commercial versus residential, is to use contextual data, which is, for example, weekend and weekday flag, or in our case, in 3.0, we think it's better to use day of the week rather than weekend or weekday, Monday by itself, Tuesday, and, and so on. And the other uh, contextual data is uh, month of the year. It could be a holiday flag. It, this is a little bit tricky because a different um, location would have different holiday flags. So this, is, this should be actually uh, analyzed and explored separately. And another thing that we may want to use that in this uh, 3.0 is the load based data, which means we use actually the time series, the historical time series of the AMI to predict the future values uh, of the AMI, um, basically forecasting rather than MMV. And this is um, uh, so useful for the demand response purposes because we, ha we need to have a short term prediction of the pattern uh, of the a uh, pattern of the electricity cons consumption of the location uh, in a short term point of view. Uh, in that case, using load based data, historical load based data can help us uh, for the demand response, not necessarily for the uh, energy efficiency uh, problems. Uh, th this is why we're talking about flexible inputs. And most importantly, uh, we definitely wanted to explore solar irradiance data and all of the possible impacts that it has for the solar customers and non-solar customers in an individual level and population level. Sorry. So what do we mean exactly by solar irradiance? And you know, we have different um, definition and different items for solar irradiance, which one we wanted to use exactly. So. The first one is direct normal irradiance, the most important, I mean, not the most important, the most obvious one, which is like solar, um, the irradiance that comes straight from uh, solar from any location that you have on the earth. This is DNI, which is, uh, those are the arrays that comes straight to the surface that you have. And imagine uh, we have a surface uh, on the horizontal level and you block the sun in a way that you don't have the shadow on the surface. So anything else that you can see, any solar or brightness that you can see from that location, the horizontal level, we call them diffuse horizontal radiance uh, from different location. We have diffuse uh, solar radiance. The summation of them in the horizontal level would be DHI. And with this formula, and DNI multiplied by cosine of theta plus DHI, we can have the global uh, horizontal irradiance. What do we mean by that? So imagine we have a flat surface in any location that we wanted to consider and explore. Uh, anything from straight from the solar uh, and anything from DHI, that would be the summation of that, which is uh, the global horizontal irradiance. Um, the analysis basically showed that the GHI has the highest correlation to the um, PV power generation. No matter what the size is, it's basically kind of a linear um, relationship, but 
Um, it depends on the um, different uh, physical aspect of the PV solar panel as well, but basically they have high uh, correlation. Armin, do you mind just yeah. pausing there for a moment yeah. to see if anybody has thoughts or questions on, on this? Because I think these concepts are a little tricky and they sure. are going to be things we're going to be coming back to fairly often, I, I suspect. Yeah, yeah Glenn. Uh, uh, Glenn. Yeah, yeah uh, very interesting. Uh, do you know what the source is for the DHI data? That, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to explain that in in next slide or a couple of uh, next okay. slides. Okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All good. Yeah, good question. It's always nice when somebody asks the question you're you're going toward. It means we're on the same page there. Okay. Other questions that folks have or or thoughts. Has, has anybody else used uh, solar radiance data before? Greg, awesome. So basically, uh, one extra thing I wanted to mention here, DNI and DHI, um, we can use the physical model of the solar PV panels with these two values basically at each given time, but um, you need to have some parameters, uh, uh, some prime like the capacity of the solar panel or the tilt angle or the orientation angle of the PV panel. And basically this is not uh, available in pretty much all of the locations that we have. And the only thing that we have normally that if that's that uh, smart reader has a solar PV panel or not. And based on that, you can infer all of those parameters. So to simplify that, we just use the global horizontal irradiance it's a really good indicator of the solar and PV generation. But to be more specific, if you want to go to the physical based model, DNI and DHI are better to use, but for our purpose, GHI is the best. Right, so in your literature review, Armin, I'm curious, did you see that most strategies were trying to reconstitute the actual parameters of the physical solar panels their angles and their capacity or their size or did you see that most models were assuming that it wasn't necessary to reconstitute those parameters and was was just kind of looking at the response of the building with respect to uh solar irradiance itself so basically both, but in the MMV literature review, uh, I didn't even see any of the papers that use solar data for the MMV purposes, mm -hmm. but these type of data and data sets used for solar disaggregation rather than uh, AMR counterfactual. And within those literature review, uh, literatures that they, um, for the solar disaggregation, a couple of them use GHI as the um, solar proxy, mm -hmm. and the other ones use the physical model of uh, PV panels, which relies on DNI, DHI, azimuth, zenith, and all of those variables that comes with the location of the sun, and depends on the time of the year, and cloudiness, and all of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is so much uh, harder to use them because you need more data, you need three absolute variables, which are the size of the PV, a tilt angle of the solar panel, and orientation angle, which orientation is it towards south, towards north, and these are hard to infer. And we want our model to be as fast as possible. This is something that I'll talk about it in a couple of next slides. That's okay, why okay, we, yeah. yeah. So, but suffice to say just for the moment until we dig into it a little bit more that it's not as simple as just saying oh we're gonna disaggregate the solar data because what we're really talking about are all these other variables that you either need to infer or you need to ignore uh in order yeah. to to do that well it's it's not just like oh my same model can do this can do a counterfactual really well and can disaggregate solar really well without a lot of extra steps involved exactly they're pretty much two separate problems 
-hmm. they may give us the AMI counterfactual, but uh, how accurate you are in terms of solar disaggregation, you actually need submeter data to evaluate for at least a few couple of uh, meters yeah. to just evaluate your model, which I'll talk about it in a couple of slides. Okay, we're getting too far ahead of you. Feel free to keep yeah. going then. Like, sure. Uh, so did I explain this? No, okay. So this is the time series of three days, three random days for a, a random uh, smart meter uh, that we have. The blue curve is the AMI value straight out of the smart meter um, uh, AMI. And we can see that we have um, negative values that shows that we have a, a PV, a solar PV uh, customer here. And the orange curve shows the GHI. This is not the uh, output of the solar panel. This is not submeter data. This is the GHI of that location that we get from uh, the data set that I'll explain later which data set it is. And uh, for the whole year, the correlation between GHI and AMI in minus point, almost minus 0.7, which is a, which shows a high correlation between these two time series. And why my, why negative? Because uh, we know that AMI is load minus solar. That's that makes sense. So that means the higher the GHI is, we have the ne more negative AMI, which means we have more uh, solar panel generation. So this is a really high correlation between these two time series, uh, which is a great thumbs up for us that we need to use solar irradiance data in our analysis. And then for the, at the same time, uh, we only use temperature before. You can see the temperature and AMI time series actually have minus 0.3. Uh, the correlation is like less than GHI, at least like half of it. So basically that means GHI is more representative of AMI value rather than temperature. But that doesn't mean that temperature is not a good predictor. Actually, temperature is a really good predictor when we don't have GHI, which is at night or cloudy days. Temperature is the one that kicks in and predict basically the load behavior or electricity consumption behavior of the house. And the solar is more like a uh, predictor for the solar part of that, uh, for example, in the middle of the day. Armin, did you look at the correlation actually between temperature and GHI, the solar irradiance? Because I, yeah, curious. I can take a look at it right now here. <laughs> I don't know if you have time for that. I think <laughs> probably the reason we have negative, you might look at a negative correlation with temperature and say that's odd. I would think most buildings would increase their electric electricity consumption with, with temperature. But I would be willing to bet a lot that for most buildings that have solar, you probably would see a negative correlation with temperature because the higher temperatures occur on hotter days, hot, well, hotter yeah. days, hot, on, on summer days where the days are longer. The higher temperatures occur on longer days. So you get more solar generation, which leads to less uh, AMI in the AMI curve. Yeah, um, yeah there's a question, uh, Vikrant, did you have a thought or a question? Yeah, I had a thought of uh, like on the previous slide and on this, this one, uh, did you guys take a look at the active energy export model and not just the net energy so that you can get more correlation with the ghi and maybe with temperature oh so we don't have the submitter data at least the assumption is that we don't have the submitter data no, otherwise no. uh, this is not a submitter within the same meter you have different registers and for where you have solar the meter actually tracks two different variable one active energy import which is your import from the grid and active energy export in the same smart meter. So if yeah, you, if so, you model... yeah, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. But uh, so within the data pipeline that we have before we do any like R&D or anything like metering that we have, uh, the data that we get, it's just basically uh, AMI data. Before data cleaning, I believe in some locations we have export and import, which makes sense that exactly the, the amounts that you mentioned, but we have the 
uh, aggregation value for each time step. But you're right. If if we have that, that would be great to use. But uh, as yeah, of now, I mean, potentially, have. Armin, I think the the main goal of this modeling exercise is to produce an accurate AMI counterfactual. So I think while you might see greater correlation, I'm not sure exactly what you would see. Uh, it, you know, if we look at these three days here as an example, uh, you, know, you can see zero on the y-axis is basically right in the middle of the graph. On that very first day where you have the lowest solar irradiance, you also have very little uh, net importing onto the grid. Uh, the second day where you have a little bit more, you actually have less importing even. And then on the third day, when you have the most GHI, you have a lot of negative consumption, which means a lot of, of uh, exporting onto the grid, I should say. Uh, so like in this case, I'm not sure that the correlation, if you just take these three days as an example, I'm not sure you would see a lot of correlation there necessarily. Uh, and I'm not sure how, uh, you know, ultimately the correlation isn't really what we're after. And we're also not necessarily after um a prediction of how much is going to be exported onto the grid what we are after is in this analysis is just making sure we can smell test whether or not we do see these kinds of uh patterns emerge where when you have a lot of ghi you do see significantly uh you do see a much bigger dip in the middle of the day whether you're going to have any export onto the grid depends on the sizing of the pv system relative to the building uh, so anyway, it's just to say what we're ultimately trying to achieve here is an accurate counterfactual for the AMI data. Um, but if, if you have thoughts on like why we would want to be looking at the net export and how it would help us develop an accurate AMI counterfactual, uh, we're, we're open ears on, on that front. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly what I was uh, going to. So in this scenario for these three random days, we're, we're getting minus 0.67, right? No, we're getting the minus minus across years. the whole year. Oh. So basically okay. what I wanted to say, no. if we have high correlation, that's great. But if I have low correlation, there might be a reason for that. For example, for the temperature, we know at night we have high, if, if, we have, if I just plot or uh, calculate the correlation for the night, um, and correlation between temperature and AMI, we're going to have a higher positive correlation. So the, the whole purpose here was if we have high correlation, that's great. If not, we need to explore. Right, right. So what I was looking at is basically exactly I'm on the same page, but what I was looking at is that here we are looking at only two, two variable interaction. But in reality, the observed kilowatt hour is a combined effect, right? There are multiple yes. variables that 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 uh, that make that kilowatt hour, whereas there's only one well, we variable don't have that. for now. Yeah. So if we if we segregate those, uh, I would say different scenarios, and then take a look at those uh, interactions, we may come with a better counterfactual for AMI. Yeah, hundred percent. But most of the cases that we have, almost all of them. Uh, we don't have that type of data, which is exported minus the imported. If we have them, yes, that 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 would be great. Actually, well, we, yeah, Armin, like we do. We do. I actually, uh, in most cases, I think we do have that data. We, by the time it is cleaned, we've combined it. But it's not to say that we can't go back to the raw data and and pull out the net energy metering versus the. Uh, Versus the uh, what, what you know we we call it delivered and received or import export but we're talking about delivered and received it's from the utilities perspective how much energy are they delivering to a building versus how much energy are they receiving from the building and we do usually get when when you have solar PV customers we do usually get both of those data streams but still that doesn't necessarily means the positive one is the load and negative one is the solar. So that that's it. That's, that's right. The that, solar yeah. the solar generation you have to dip below zero at at an at a whole building level before you start to have net energy metering. Exactly. So you, you the classic case is you have a commercial building and they have a solar PV system 
but that system never produces enough for the entire building load to go negative. Yeah. And we see that quite often. So for that, you know, just that's just an example, but it's a good limiting case to think about because yeah. in that scenario, you're you literally have nothing to look at. Uh, so in, in, in then other scenarios, you have dramatically oversized solar PV systems relative to the to the building load. You know that can yeah. happen when a solar contractor shows up at your door and says, "I promise you, you know zero, you know zero dollar bills for the duration of when you keep solar PV on your rooftop." Um, so, you know, everybody falls somewhere in between those two extremes. Um, and so I think it's, I, I think Vikram, maybe we should, we should take uh, this offline if you have other, like, I, I'm curious to know a little bit more about how specifically you think this could lead to a better AMI counterfactual, because I, I have to admit, I'm just not seeing it just in the, in the immediate few minutes that we're talking about it here. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. We can take it uh, further uh, into discussion, uh, but. But just adding a little food for thought is so in previous slides you showed that you are modeling each month individually. Uh, we are in the in the 2.0 model, but the we are reformulating that model to move away from that paradigm. Right, right. So this minus 0.67 would then, uh, in that case, would be different for each trail. Each That's month. Yeah. This is just solely. I brought this just to show that they have high correlation. That's right, it. Right, right. And on the, on the next slide where we have the interaction with temperature, you're looking at temper average temperature or peak temperature. And if you were to use cooling degree day, CDD, how would that look like? Uh, we don't want to go that way. Basically, I want to, uh, we want to introduce time series based analysis uh, rather than CDD, HED, and uh, those are, I think those are a little bit hard to interpret and we want let the model to decide which one is important. So I, I haven't done that, but if it's necessary, if uh, we need that later on, uh, we decide to do that, uh, then we can do that. Yeah, it, it is a good point that for like a correlation analysis like this, uh, it may be, you might be able to get a much higher correlation if you were having a set point temperature, right? I mean zero degrees Fahrenheit is just embedded within some range of temperatures. <laughs> you know, we, we probably could be using Kelvin here for all we care. Um, like what would matter would be CDD and HDD. I, I, I totally agree with that. But again, it's just kind of a smell check to see what the what this kind of looks like, um, just to make sure that there is a need for the incorporation of these variables. And I, I think we're seeing that when you look at these kinds of very simple correlations, as flawed as they may be, uh, that indeed is what we're picking up here. Uh, Greg, you have a, a question real quick? Yeah, just a comment, and um, it may not even matter because you have a fair amount of collinearity between temperature and, and insulation or radiance or whatever, but um, like at the physical level, if you kind of eliminate all the other, everything else, you increase temperature actually decrease the efficiency of of the solar cell right because it increases um you know it decreases conductivity yeah. so uh i'm curious if including both of those things even matters i think it's like fractional compared to obviously you know uh irradiance being like the number one term for determining you know output but uh yeah they're they're uh inversely correlated right temperature and yeah, exactly. uh, and insulation at some point so for the solar disaggregation, actually, we need to do that and yes, uh, for the solar disaggregation. And to do that, we need to use this um, physical model. And then, therefore, we need to introduce, like in the, in, in the function, you have the temperature, which has negative correlation. You have the NIDH and all of those things. So that by itself considered the whole uh, time series by itself. Uh, but here, we're using these Temp like temperature, um, GHI, uh, humidity, and all of those things as an input feature. And we let the model decide how they are best correlated to each other. And then what are the coefficients should be based on the mapping to the target that we want, which is the AMI. 
Okay. Yeah, this is super. This is a really good discussion because I think as when you know when we were in the 2.1 research, we largely kept the model formulation being uh, very sort of traditional. And we introduced things like penalization functions, and we introduced things like uh, elastic net and the kinds of uh, machine learning algorithms that are commonplace in you know most modern applications these days. But uh, but the model itself was largely very interpretable, and it and once it sort of settled on a final formalism to best model any given meter, the parameters were largely sort of um, you know the, the the model formulation was fairly rigid, and and that was fine and it was by design that way you know we use the daily model for many things including heating and cooling load disaggregation so you, you kind of want that you kind of need those those characteristics of a model like that but in the hourly model i don't feel like we're bound by those same kinds of limitations so you can this is something we're all going to have to kind of get used to a little bit more because where where I think we feel like there's an opportunity to improve on the 2.0 framework is by letting the machine actually tell us what's important and 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 settling on the right uh, weightings and things like that. And uh, that's really essential when you want to introduce more variables and you want to make the model aware of more things and still avoid overfitting. Uh, so uh, Armin, Let's move to this. Let's move to the next section because I think that's you're going to get into some of that, and we can. Yeah, sure. yeah and and like this will be a point we can come back to. Yeah. So I think Greg asked the question over team. So this is for the R and D purposes right now because we have the data from 2018 to 2021. We use NREL data set, which is open, free, open source, free, and then you can access from 1998 till end of 2021 as of now. Uh, but if you want, and they include temperature, and by the way, th their temperature is a little bit different from NOAA temperature. That's something that we need to explore la later on. Um, I saw like their co correlation is like 0.8, which is not good to temperature at same location. They don't have that much of a, a good correlation. So that's something like an edge. So uh, we have uh, solar data, uh, all the other data uh, that we need. Uh, but if you want um, more current data or with high resolution, we need to buy those solar data specifically from commercial uh, entities like um, Solcast, Metromatics, and Solar Anywhere. And yeah, so that's just uh, like a note. Um, put it right here, and there are links to it. Okay, so. If you remember in the in Caltrack 2.1, in order to remove uh, overfitting, uh, 2.1, uh, in order to remove overfitting and actually evaluate our uh, methods um, all the way uh, from R&D to, uh, to the um, product, we use test strain split. So what do we mean by test strain? Uh, we have a data set, we shuffle the data set, um, we use a chunk of it for uh, to train the model, and then after that, we evaluate the whole model and the performance of the model on the test set, the, the unseen data set, so we can have a realistic uh, uh, representation of the error for that specific model. So the main purpose is model performance uh, evaluation. And then why we are using that, if we... Um, uh, so that, that would be a metric for us, that, that error in the test set and um, train set. If uh, we have an overfit model, which means we, we are doing great in the train set, uh, the error is almost zero, but we're doing a bad job uh, for the test set, then we have an overfit model, which we believe that 2.0 hourly um, is a little bit overfit. And underfit means uh, we're doing a bad job in train and test it at the same time. We want to find that uh, sweet spot. Um, how we do that, we just uh, do that process of test train. We evaluate the model on the test, come back and change the hyperparameter, change the model in some sort of way so we can find the just uh, good model uh, for, uh, for the 3.0. Okay, 
So that was test train split, which means one time we separate a chunk of it as a train and a chunk of it as a test set. If we do that couple of times, multiple times, for example, for the first column, imagine we separate 90% of our data set randomly and train the, our model and, and test it on the orange part, which is the te uh, test data set. And we have an error for that orange part. And we do that, let's say 10 times, uh, we, which we call it 10 k, uh, 10 fold cross validation. We have 10 test error that each of them supposed to show uh, and be a representative of the model error. By doing that, uh, we're gonna have, uh, the mean value of these would be a great realization of the, uh, of the error of the model for the next batch of data that we get. So why we do that and how, what, it, what are the other use cases of the cross-validation? is that the first one is that imagine we have just the baseline and we don't have any extra month or extra year of the data that we can test our data set. Therefore, we need to sample from what I already have in order to somehow evaluate our model and the performance of the model. And the second use case is, um, um, actually, actually these two are uh, connected to, to each other. The other use case is to go back to the model. Every time we have the cross-validation, we have an error, a train and test error, go back, change the hyperparameter in a way that we have a, uh, goes towards the just right model rather than underfit and overfit. And then last part in our case in the 3.0, which I'll show you later, is to calculate uncertainty. Because if you do that 10 times for each time, spot, time slot, you have 10 prediction. Therefore, you, you can come up with the uncertainty level and then have a, a better understanding of how the model is doing. Uh, for the train test sampling, uh, when I said randomly we, uh, we shuffled the data and we have the test part and the test part and, and the train part, in the 2.1 daily, uh, if you remember in the process, uh, we use a stratified sampling, which means each day, or was a member of a weekend or weekday. And at the same time, it was inside of one season. So we wanted to have the same portion. Let's say we want 10% of data in our test set, but we wanted to have 10% of the Mondays in the test set as well. Like we don't want any Monday in the test set. That's, that's not a good sampling strategy because we these, uh, um, contextual features are actually important for us. Uh, that's why we call it a stratified sampling. And in the 3.0, this is hourly. We pretty much do the same thing, but instead of one point in each, uh, each day was a point in daily. Now inside of each day, we have 24 hours of data for the feature, uh, feature input. That can be temperature, that can be uh, GHI or anything else. But all together, that day, for example, the first Monday of January, it's one sample. It's independent from other days. That's a sample. We do that stratified sampling this time based on day of the week and month of the year. These are one hot vector based on these. Uh, we stratify sampling. Uh, so any questions so far about the train test sampling? So now about the models, those were just uh, how we can sample the data to test or evaluate any, pretty much any model that we have, any model that we want to explore. Uh, we have a couple of options to start with. Uh, the most obvious ones are uh, uh, CycleLearn uh, library that they have multiple regression models. I brought just a couple of them here. We have linear regression, lesser, and ridge regression, elastic net, which is a combination of all of the above. And uh, these are uh, the Adabus regressor, extra two regressors. These are ensemble models, which we will exp um, explore them later. We can use neural nets, as we mentioned before in the previous session. 
or we can just go to the route of solar disaggregation, have the physical model, have a load model, and that load model can be any of the above um, methodologies that I mentioned, and they need to talk to each other in order to disaggregate the solar. But I wanted to mention a couple of pros and cons of the solar disaggregation uh, and why we don't want to go this route, um, at least for now, uh, at least for benchmark. The pros is that obviously we have uh, a separate signal for the solar and the load, and we can um, analyze them separately in an individual level, feeder level, utility level, and it's good for the prediction in the future and all those things. But the, the main uh, purpose of solar disaggregation is actually not the AMR counterfactual, rather, rather a good separation of these two. And to do this separation, based on my experience uh, so far, uh, you need two different models. You need to consider physical aspects of the PV solar panel, like uh, exactly that I mentioned, uh, the PV size, the tilt angle, the orientation angle. And therefore you need to uh, have a more complex model specifically for extracting, extracting uh, the load pattern of each individual house. You need uh, neural nets. I use other methodologies, but neural nets was the one that actually could handle the nonlinearity. And therefore you need more iteration because these two needs to talk to each other, more complexity, which leads to higher ca calculation time. And uh, we need to uh, focus on um, one, a, a, a good uh, accuracy for AMR counterfactual. At the same time, we need to uh, handle large amounts of smart meters, like millions of uh, smart meters. So therefore we need to be fast enough uh, to implement that. And uh, to do this evaluation, you need some, uh, at least a few or a couple of uh, meter IDs that they have actually submitted data to evaluate your um, solar disaggregation methodology. That's why we don't want to go towards solar disaggregation, at least at this point. So as a benchmark, I just wanted to uh, explore one of the, sweetest spot models it's not that simple and it's not that uh, complex um, and that's a great benchmark uh, in my opinion it's a linear model it's basically linear regression but we are adding two penalization factor to it one is the l1 norm or the summation of absolute values for the coefficients so basically in the um and like uh, Adam, can you see my uh, cursor, the mouse cursor here? Move it around a little bit more. Yeah. No, I don't think so, Armin. No. Okay, so let me see if I can use any. So I can, okay, so it doesn't matter. The first part of the equation that we have, y minus x uh, multiplied by beta. Beta is the, uh, is the coefficient of the linear regression. So the red part is the L1 norm, which is the summation of all of the absolute values of these uh, coefficients. Basically, this wants to force them to be zero, this penalization, which means we want to uh, select the features. This, these are uh, feature selection penalization, the L1, or generate a sparse model. That, that's the purpose of it. And L2 norm is actually the sum up squared of the coefficients, which means this is still penalize the models to not have a big uh, coefficients, but th this time basically reduce the impact of the noise or irrelevant features to that uh, mapping the features to the <coughs> sorry um, to the targets. So these these are the results of one uh, smart meter. These are uh, raw data, so this, this is not aggregation or anything. This is basically a house data. And the blue curve is the AMI data. This is straight out of smart meter data, uh, smart meter. So the blue curve is the actual value. The orange curve is Caltrack 2.0 model. And so we did a model. This is Caltrack uh, 2.0 counterfactual. And the results of the elastic net, those prediction based on the just temperature, we gave it temperature time series. For, so for each day, we have 24 hours time series. So we have 24 coefficient for that. 
and we have contextual features, which is uh, day of the week and month of the year. So these one, uh, they are aware of which day and which month uh, of the year they are in. And the, the shadow area is uncertainty. So basically in this case, in the day one, these are two days in day one, Caltrack 2.0 is doing better uh, compared to the elastic net because we have more segmentation for uh, Caltrack um, uh, the 2.0, which we have the temperature beaning, we have occupants and all those things. And have that in mind that a 2.0 is a, a overfit model, which means it uses all of the baseline data and then uh, implemented uh, for, I mean, trains based on uh, all of the baseline data. So there's no untouched data to evaluate. But this case, this is in the test data set. These two days are in the test data set that I'm, that I'm showing you. So uh, in, in the day two, we're basically doing the same thing because we have a higher uh, PV generation. Why I'm saying that, because if you go to the next slide and we compare the time that we just have temperature only and temperature and GHI, now the model is aware of the of the cloudiness of the uh, of the, this specific day. Although we are in the train, we are in the test data set. We haven't seen that, but we know the correlation between GHI and the AMI value. So the the Caltrack 2.0 and observed value unchanged, basically the same. Of course, they should be the same. But the prediction of the elasticness when we are using GHI, it imp improved. Uh, significantly, specifically in a day that we have a cloudy day, because we know the uh, correlation between these two. We know the relation. We saw that in the in the mapping in the train data set. So Armin, just to summarize here, yeah. the top plot is, well, both of these plots are the same two 48 hour periods for one single meter, correct? Yes. And the observed data is in blue. Yes, and the model prediction for Caltrack 2.0 is in orange, and that's the same between both these two plots. Yes, and then the thing that's different is that in the top plot, the elastic net model that we're testing is we're only feeding it temperature uh, in addition to month and hour of day and those kinds of things. But in yes. the bottom plot, we're also then including GHI. So the first day where we have that big first dip is a cloudy day. So if the model is only aware of temperature, and that's true for both Caltrack 2.0 and the elastic net model on the top plot, then both of them sort of predict a dip um, that the, the Caltrack 2.0 model is sort of doing a little bit better, probably because because it's a cloudy day, it's also a little bit cooler, I would guess. Yes. Um, whereas the bottom plot, uh, now the elastic net model is also aware of solar irradiance, um, and there is very little solar irradiance. So it basically wipes out the prediction of uh, the dip itself because the solar PV system, it's not expecting the solar PV system to, to produce anything. Yes. And one more thing I want to add for the first plot, the, the top plot, the, uh, the 2.0 model has seen that day before. That's why it has a little bit of like less error in that day. And it tried to minimize that gap alongside all other days that's similar to that day. So for example, if there is another day with the same temperature or with a higher GHI, therefore this took the middle rather than yeah. being close so part, to the so other. So part days. of the orange line, part of the orange line is uh, a reflection of the fact that it's being trained on this very same day. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So just to reemphasize with, with folks, uh, this whole cross-validation scheme that Armin was talking about is something that we intend to apply on both the model we're testing uh, and developing as well as Caltrack 2.0. So one of the things that will be very interesting to see, which I don't, I do not think has ever been done to this point, 
is an actual analysis of the degree to which Caltrack 2.0 is overfit. Uh, and ultimately what we need to be seeking is an understanding of how well each of these models, 2.0 and any new model that we're evaluating, uh, is performing on data that it has not seen before. How well is it performing in a predictive context, not just a context where at least part of the data is data that it is actually being trained on. Uh, so it's going to be really important, as it was in 2.1, it's going to be very important here to create a legit test train. Uh, and, and by the way, it was interesting in 2.1, you know, it was the daily model and the Caltrack 2.0 daily model was very underfit. So in a way, we didn't have to worry too much about 2.0. Uh, but here in, in uh, hourly, the hourly model, the 2.0 hourly model is likely pretty overfit. So you can fool yourself into thinking that your new model is not doing as well uh, relative to 2.0. Um, but what you're really seeing is an unfair comparison because the 2.0 model is, is overfit. Now, the other way to go about this is to say, look, we're going to test these models on reporting period data. So we're going to train a model in a baseline period, and then we're going to project that model forward as a counterfactual into a reporting period. Um, the problem with that is you things change over time. And you don't want to end up optimizing a model based on trends that are happening within a population. There are ways to potentially avoid that. You know, you could like train a model on reporting period data and then predict baseline period data, and you can mix up the timelines and things like that. Uh, but really, I think it's probably a little bit of a cleaner solution to stick with a 365 day baseline period and just remove small samples in a cross validation scheme as withheld test data. Uh, and so we're going to try these things out. And I think that's when we're going to start to learn a lot. But it's nice to see that even in this case where you know, we're only looking at two days, so these are not some kind of comprehensive population level results or anything like that. Uh, but it's nice to see that the model's behaving relatively well, and there's a major difference, as we would expect, when you allow it to be aware of the GHI data. Um, Glenn, Thank yeah, you. Glenn, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah, thanks. This is a really interesting discussion. I'm really enjoying it. Um, um, what you've just been explaining, uh, it goes back to, uh, what you mentioned earlier during the discussion with Bitgrunt, uh, uh, you know, really what we want to do is predict a co counterfactual. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, um, I mean, this is one example for one meter, I understood. So what, what is, uh, is that going to be kind of a typical scenario where we just have one meter? I mean, would this analysis apply to all 10 million uh, uh, meters that pg and &E has, for example? I mean, uh, uh, so when we're doing the analysis, is it just one meter at a time? Is it, uh, are we averaging yeah. a whole bunch of meters across the whole program that might be a thousand meters or something like that? Uh, uh, just just for background context would be interesting to see. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. Actually, after individual level, uh, we definitely will go to the uh, population level, which I did. Um, the result is in a different model, but after this, like uh, here, one of the options is the next step is to implement it to the population level here. And in the population level, we will compare the 2.0 error and the current or any model that we develop uh, uh, within the process. Either it's elastic. Elastic means was the simplest one, the quickest one. And uh, I have to mention that the whole model 10 times when we do that, uh, we train elastic net 10 times uh, for this the whole year for this is a specific uh, smart meter it took 0.2 seconds for the whole 10 um, um 10 k fold which means this one is fast it's this the simplest and we basically match in the test set we basically match the result of the 2.0 so the model is simple is fast we have uncertainty and for the individual level, we can do that. And then for the better comparison of if the if the 2.0 is better or worse than a, another model, 
we need to do the population level test. It, yeah, and I, Greg, uh, to another aspect of your question there, I think it's very interesting. We have always uh, felt like it's important to be able to model individual meters. Uh, individual customers participate in programs, and it's very nice to be able to say, uh, this is the savings that we're measuring for an individual meter. Um, and then you aggregate those results to any level that you want to see. You can aggregate on time. You can aggregate on uh, customers that are participating. Having said that, there's nothing fundamentally stopping anybody from using the open EE meter model uh, uh, post aggregation. So you could take a million meters from PG&E, you can aggregate all of them together, and then you can run them through the Caltrack model as one single meter trace, get a result back in 0 0.2 seconds, <laughs> and have a counterfactual. Right. And in most kinds of scenarios, you wouldn't really have some sort of overfitting issue that you might more be more likely to see with a single meter. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah, you can error would be incorrect. incorrect. There's, there's nothing about there's nothing about the aggregation itself that is going to alleviate overfitting. I see. Okay. Yeah. It, so it's it's not like you can say okay. I mean, so think about it this way: if you if you aggregate uh, to an 8760 profile from all of PG&E's residential meters and you throw a model at it that has 5,000 parameters, you still have you know, almost as many parameters as you do data points that you're feeding into the model. So there, there's, nothing, there's nothing there that is gonna prevent overfitting just, just purely because you've aggregated something. I see. Yeah, the, is the issue here is that the error is going to be incorrect. The error that's coming from this aggregated, uh, you aggregate all of your meters and then you create a model on that during that aggregation process, you are basically ignoring all of the variance in the data. And so then the only error that you are seeing is the error of the model. And that's likely to not be the largest con uh, contributor to your error. So you're basically saying, I don't care about error when you do that. Very good, very good point. Yeah, yeah so so what, uh, if I can just reiterate, so I'll make sure I understand, uh, um, you aggregate all of the, the individual meters after you run the these models that we're looking at here as opposed to aggregating all the data together and then running the models that is correct if you do if you aggregate after you preserve the error and your models are going to be accurate at an individual level if you aggregate before you don't really know what your error is going to be right, you only right. have whatever yeah. the the model prediction is yeah yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Mm -hmm. sure. And one more thing, like in the aggregated level or in individual, these input features goes through a normalization. So either you have a commercial building or a residential, we squeeze the time the time series to the zero and one or whatever limit it is. And one is faster and it doesn't um really care about what type of uh, um, location or data that you're dealing with. That's why the aggregation, commercial and residential, pretty much would be the same for this model. I see, I see. Okay, cool. But, but the takeaway is, is we should assume uh, when we're doing all of these data val uh, model validations and which one's the best, we should assume we're only working with one meter uh, for one year of data or I think it's, I think that's, as Travis said, that's, that's how we are setting this up and, and are intending right. for the model to be used. But it's, I, I, I still think that as long as you understand, as long as you understand the caveats, uh, it, it's probably okay. Uh, I think if you, my guess, and people can argue this, including people at Recurve, <laughs> Um, feel free to contradict me, but my guess is that if you take a million meters and you plug and you aggregate them and then you uh, create maybe a forecast or whatever it would be because you have a counterfactual, uh, obviously you don't have 
most of the time, if you have a million meters, you probably aren't looking at a million program participants unless you're talking about the home energy reports program. Um, then you're after some kind of a forecast, I would assume. And yeah, you want error bars on your forecast without a doubt. Uh, but if you have a million meters, I would guess the variance isn't isn't like, I don't know. I mean, Travis, what do you think about that? If you have a million meters, just just for sake of depends argument. On the, depends on what the purpose of this is. If you're trying to forecast all of these uh, meters at the same time, so you just summon them all up, um, yeah, in that case, it's it's fine so long as that information is never used at a more fine scale. Here, we think it's like this for an individual. It's nonsense at that point. Right, but if right. you're just looking at overall, then it's it's fine. Yeah, it's 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 super interesting because I, I do think that there are some real advantages to looking at individual meters and then aggregating from there, because. Number one, you can then do any aggregations post modeling that you want to. And that's a huge, huge advantage. Second thing is you know, we've worked with a lot of utility data. And um, you know, when we when we work with utility data, we see repeatedly that like there's a bunch of missing data a lot of the time. Sure. Um and and so you know you wind up with with new construction you wind up with customers that just have missing data in their in their smart meter trace you you wind up with customers that um you know just got a solar pv system installed or or, or things like that where there are like big changes within any given any given customer so in that sense your your quality control happens at an individual meter level um, and I think it's really easy to kind of like just aggregate everything, ignoring the fact that it's half the battle is cleaning the individual meter data. At least half the battle is a lot of the time. So anyway, just just worth keeping that in mind that you kind of just it doesn't the aggregation step and like when you do it, I think depends on the use case, but it doesn't there, it's not a magic trick. There's still a lot yeah. of hard work to be done. It, what, what, what it can help you with is if you're like, look, I don't have the computational power to run a million meters independently. I do need to do some pre-aggregation that I, I definitely would understand that, you know. Right, right. But the, when when we're all done here, we're, we're not going to have uh, different different models for different meters or anything like that. Uh, it's, we're we're going to use the same model uh, regardless of what the, the structure. Is. The structure of the model is the same, which means like elasticness and the hyperparameter is the same. But the coefficient for each individual house oh, sure. is different and sure. it's for itself. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you very much. Hope I didn't go too far off target. No, there. no, good. This super oh, good great. question. Yeah, super good questions. And and thoughts. You know, it's 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 nice for us to hear just how people are even thinking about these things um, and what your use cases are. Um, any other quick thoughts or questions before we wrap up here? Armin, did you want to cover the next steps briefly? Yeah, real quick. So uh, we wanted to implement different types of models that we have that I mentioned in the SQL Learn library uh, from uh, random forest and all of those uh, ensemble models, which are really uh, promising. Uh, and this elastic you know, was pretty much the simplest one. And as you can see, the result is good and it's fast. It's really fast. And that's why we wanted to analyze the calculation, calculation time as well, because as uh, Adam mentioned, the millions of smart meter, we need to uh, be as fast as possible. And uh, we need to use different types of inputs. That's one of the options that we wanted to have the flexibility in the input features, temperature, humidity, and all of those things, even squeeze the window size instead of one day, let's say two days. What if like we wanted to use a week of the, a week or all of those analysis for the input data. And we wanted to implement the same model, the same structure model for the non-solar data set as well. And we wanted to see how we were doing over there as well, because there are the majority of the 
smart millionaires anyway we need to do uh, good in both of the uh, data sets solar and non-solar and we need to do a population analysis uh, for the hyperparameter tuning awesome yeah. thank you armin yeah. uh and i think we can call it there it sounds like or greg please go ahead if you have a question or thought Hope that was an excellent answer for that. Okay. Uh, making a lot of progress here. So just to summarize, looking to kind of put the final pieces together for 2.1. We're working on the code base right now, looking forward to releasing that and uh, just putting it out there in the wild after all this hard work on that front. And uh, making some progress on the 3.0 model for hourly. Um, and we're just in the early stages there, but seeing some promising results. So. Uh, we've got some groundwork to do to get some of these sampling strategies in place. And then I think the fun uh, is really going to get started. So uh, tune in next time around for, you know, another good discussion. And we just want to say thanks to everybody who came this time. And it's been good to have everybody uh, contributing. So keep your, you know, definitely come with questions, come with thoughts for the next time around. We'll talk to everybody soon.